He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Hi, Michael Wright here. And Katie Gossett. And welcome to a special bonus episode of White Silence. This episode is a bit different. If you've just stumbled across us, White Silence is the story of the Erebus disaster, an Air New Zealand sightseeing flight that crashed into the Mount Erebus volcano in Antarctica in 1979. All 257 people on board were killed. To mark the 40th anniversary, we've told the story of this tragedy and its painful aftermath in a six-part series. You don't have to have heard that to understand what we're doing here, but it will help. White Silence came out nearly three weeks ago, and we've had a great response from listeners since then. A lot of people got in touch to tell us about how the tragedy affected them. If you listen to the series, you might remember the refrain, if you didn't know someone on the flight, you knew someone who did. That's really rung true from what these people had to say. Like Air New Zealand staff, who talked of getting back in the air. Nothing like counselling available back then. We all bounded together as one. Forget about rank. You'd form a circle and protect each other. Ordinary people thrust into extraordinary circumstances, preparing a morgue for hundreds of bodies. The first lot that came through still had snow attached to their person, which was really, really moving. We've heard some new insights into major players in the Erebus story. He told me things that I vowed that I would never repeat. And we have some things that we couldn't otherwise fit into the podcast. It was very shallow to even play. That's what the organisers wanted us to do, and that's what we did. And so, we've got a few more stories to share. Episode 7, Playing Through. I was on standby for the flight. This is John Watson, but everyone calls him Pogo. In 1979, he worked as a chief purser with Air New Zealand. As you heard, if his colleague had pulled out for any reason, he could have been on the fatal Erebus flight. If the uh, chief purser had gone sick, I wouldn't be speaking to you today. Instead, on the night of November 28, 1979, Pogo Watson went out to dinner at a friend's place. It was there that he got a call from his wife, who told him to turn on the TV. Where? The announcement had been made that it was beyond the realm of return that our aircraft had vanished. Vanished with one of Pogo Watson's good friends on board, a senior steward who, just a day earlier, had helped Pogo clean his swimming pool. He was actually at my house the night before, stating that he didn't feel like going on the flight because it was his son's fourth birthday. And I uh, mentioned to him that he, what do you think of staying home for it? But as all crew members in those days, we all turned to and went to work. When Pogo heard the plane was lost, he went to find his friend's wife. There was a bit of a crowd outside her house and then he found she was out to dinner. Unfortunately, I broke the dinner party up and asked her to come out to a private area and... Uh, Break of news. Mm. Mm, not a very nice thing to have to impart. No. no. And how did she cope? Uh, with complete silence, quite a bit of shock. I said to her, did she want to come to my house or go to her house where there was a heap of people? And she uh, decided that she would go home before we went back and did the best we could. So my name is Annie and I was ground staff for Air New Zealand based at Auckland International Airport on the 28th of November 1979. That day was a pretty regular one for Annie. She had a 2 to 10 evening shift working in the documents department underneath the airport. At one point she went up to get some files from the check-in area and headed back downstairs. It would have been about 5 in the afternoon and there was a policeman there. And normally when policemen were in the document section, they were looking for 
a naughty person who had come in or out of the country. And I said, oh, who's been naughty this time? And the policeman said, no, 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 I need the 901 flight file because the plane's missing. A few hours later, somewhere around 8 or 9 o'clock, ground staff were called together. All they were told was that an announcement was about to be made to relatives of the passengers who were anxiously waiting for news. Once that news was given, they were to help anyone who needed assistance. It is a blurred recollection, but I can remember them saying, you know, by 9 o'clock the plane will be out of fuel and we still don't know where the aircraft is. Do you remember the reactions of, of people? I think Stun Mullet would absolutely sum it up. I think there was absolute just dead silence because um, it was such an unexpected announcement that um, people were having to come to grips with it. And I guess after, I don't know, a minute or something like that, then people were sort of asking questions of... You know, where can it be? Like, any kind of questions, Katie. Annie ended up staying well past the end of her shift that night. She got talking to a group of men who'd been supporting their friend. His wife was on the plane. She answered their questions, although she had no real technical information for them. About 1am, she drove home, as shocked as the relatives she'd been talking to state of disbelief, state of how can that happen, how can a plane go missing, what's going on, <laughs> just in a fog really. Like we said earlier, Air New Zealand staff saw themselves as a family, one that had lost 20 of its own in a single day. Pogo Watson again. We all bounded together as one. Forget about rank. You'd form a circle and protect each other. Because staff just had to get on with it. Two days after the crash, Pogo Watson was back on a flight. One of the cabin crew with him had lost a brother at Erebus, but insisted he could carry on. It was business as usual, with a few differences. On some flights, newspapers that carried stories on the crash weren't handed out in the cabin. But, yeah, it, it didn't stop other passengers bringing on their own newspapers, etc. But it was a, a confusing and uh, questionable time for us all, where uh, aftermath of that why and how and, and uh, questions being asked. Most passengers were pretty good, Pogo said supportive, respectful, but there were a few who went the other way. Clowns, Pogo called them. Do you know anything about Erebus? What do you think about it? You blokes don't know what you're doing. Things like that, you know, unprofessional remarks. But that was very, 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 very little. <laughs> One of the stewards down the back, uh, senior, <laughs> was going to pull a passenger out of his seat, but luckily, with the help of everybody, that was quickly diffused. Pogo Watson knew Jim Collins, who'd captained the Erebus flight. He'd flown with him a lot and considered him one of the top five pilots in the company to fly with. His general approach to his uh, cabin crew for a start, his professionalism, his manners, he treated cabin crew exactly as he treated his first officers and flight engineers in those days, an absolute gentleman. One always felt safe knowing that uh, a person like Jim Collins was behind the uh, controls. And I have uh, no doubt about his uh, capabilities and his decisions on that particular flight. Air New Zealand staff stood by their captain. They tried to help each other too with a new support group for bereaved family members. But they were warned that if they felt they were getting too close to the families, they should pull out. I did it for two years. In the end, I... Uh... Oh, excuse me. I felt it uh, was taking too much of effect. Yeah, it was hard. 
yeah, very hard. Because I still had in uh, my mind, as I do today, that if uh, the chief person had got sick, I, I wouldn't be, uh, well, I guess, in this lucky position today. Annie was also trying to help those who had lost someone. Remember the young man whose wife died? He got in touch with Annie to thank her for what she did on the night of the crash and asked if she would meet with him again to talk. He was quite disturbed, of course, and very, very upset about his wife dying. And I have had no counselling training or anything, but you can only just be as empathetic as you can be. Unfortunately, he just couldn't bear it. Around this time, Annie had been retraining and she became a member of the flying crew. Her first trip was to Hong Kong. I think I had about three or four days in Hong Kong and when I came back, I think there was two of the ground staff who I had worked with were at the gate and they pulled me aside and told me that he had taken his life. Were you given any help with that experience, having been Don't become... Be back in those days, counselling was a new word. Um, it didn't even exist. It wasn't just Air New Zealand staff unexpectedly called upon to help after the tragedy. Our executive producer, Justin Gregory, recorded this interview with a former police officer. In 1979, George Vlasic had been a carpenter for 23 years with the same company. He was 39 and he was thinking about a change. So a neighbour suggested he apply for a job at the Auckland Police Station, mounting court exhibits and maintaining police stations, doing housing repairs and that kind of thing. And as it turned out, also helping the police with forced entry to premises. But also to go back and do the repairs <laughs> um, to the satisfaction of the landowner. George had the right skills, plus he had a clean record, so he got the job, and he was sworn in as a Regulation 24 police officer. He was now Constable Vlasic. Just three weeks in, though, his new job changed. The bodies of the Erebus victims were coming home, and the mortuary up at the Auckland School of Medicine needed to be able to take them all. I was to go up to the what I would call the School of Medicine... I don't like it to refer it to the mortuary, but it was what I will always hopefully call the School of Medicine to ascertain what was required to accept the souls that were going to be returned. We realised that there were insufficient body boards, for example, so yes, we designed and built 150 body boards out of what I would say high density custom wood. We also had to build extra shelving in those refrigerated areas. The team also put screens up over the windows to prevent anyone seeing in or worse, taking any photos. And so for three weeks, George and his teammates laboured to get the boards ready as well as constructing clothing racks to hang Air New Zealand uniforms on. Matching the uniforms to the soles helped to identify the crew. All of them felt the responsibility to get it right, for the souls, as George calls the victims, and for their families. It became automatic. We knew that we had a job to do. We needed to respect the situation. And George was there to meet and receive every one of the souls as they arrived. The first lot that came through still had snow Mm. attached to their person which was um, moving, really, really moving. At that stage of my life, I didn't realise what counselling was, but my wife, Anne, um, was my sole help at the time, and um, we were able to talk about it between ourselves, but I didn't talk about it with many other people. 
Most of the team he worked with knew or knew of someone who was on flight TE901. So they tried to view the work positively, that they were part of a long chain of people caring for these souls. But some days George just couldn't manage it, especially when he recognised someone. I recognised um, the captain and also the hostess and... Um, I'd prefer sort of not to go into further detail of, of what <coughs> was seen. George says he's an emotional man. The work he did with the Erebus souls has stayed with him to this day. It took me about two to three years to be able to go to the Waikamiti Cemetery, to be s sitting down and saying, sorry, it was really... And my wife accompanied me, yeah. and um, we just held hands. George isn't sure he can let the Erebus disaster go, and he doesn't even know if he really wants to. Again, it's about respect for him. And above all, he wants the families of all the souls he cared for to know one thing in particular. Their loved ones were, at all times, treated like they were family. From the arrival at Auckland, to the departure at the cemetery, they were treated with total dignity. If you followed the White Silence podcast and some of our other coverage, you might recall the home movie filmed by one of the passengers shortly before impact and recovered from the wreckage. It's eerie to watch. People drinking, relaxing, taking photos and crowding around windows to get a look at the icy landscape below no idea that they only have minutes to live. You can see some of this footage on the Stuff and RNZ websites. We thought for a long time before publishing. I talked to family members of victims and editors at the office. I didn't want it to be something gratuitous or traumatic. In the end, we decided to run it to help refocus the story of Erebus and the 40th anniversary on the victims themselves. Erebus has been so dogged by controversy that the stories of the passengers can kind of get lost in the noise. A lot of victims' families have felt voiceless and marginalised over the years. One person we heard from after we published was Peter Moody, who lives in Drury, just south of Auckland. He knew someone in that video, someone special to him. If you've seen the footage, you might recall a distinctive young woman walking down an aisle, blonde hair, dark glasses and carrying a camera. Her name is Melinda Arnold. She just turned 17, one of the youngest people on the flight. Peter Moody was her boyfriend at the time. He'd never seen the footage, only heard it existed. And when he saw it, he was stunned to see Melinda looking back at him after all these years. He wrote me an email about her. It was so beautifully done, I asked him if we could use it. Peter's words here are read by an actor. Melinda had her whole life ahead of her, but taken from us so young. She was my dance partner and girlfriend. We were good ballroom dancers, Melinda loved to dance. I lost the passion when I lost her. Equally tough was that the flight was a special birthday present from her aunt Valerie, who also was lost that day. Melinda was also my first love, and I guess the double tragedy of losing a special friend so young and being part of a national disaster was, at the time, extremely emotional for a young man. Not only for me, but all our young friends that were around. I think in part today, whenever I see and hear of a teenager's life lost in any tragic accident, I feel deep empathy for the friends that are left behind. And also reflect on how the young today seem to be more free to talk about such tragedies. I think there is also more support networks around for managing grief. In 1979, our youth didn't have such freedoms or the support. Seeing Melinda on that passenger film footage brought back deep emotions for me and an awareness that I didn't really have full closure in myself. I didn't realise that I'd suppressed so much from that day and how that had affected me all this time. But the footage is very special. Actually seeing her and knowing that she was enjoying the moment gives me a smile and adds to a repertoire of fond memories. I'm surprised in myself that what I feel now is as real as it was 40 years ago. I am glad that 40 years later, the story is retold, reflected on and shared. 
It is great that finally a national memorial in one place will pay due respect to all those that lost their lives on November 28, 1979. I remember that day so vividly, even 40 years on. These days I have a beautiful supportive wife, now married 30 years and still growing strong. She never met Melinda, but understands how it all fits in with both our lives. She will be by my side at this special commemoration, and later we will visit Melinda's grave. You might remember that way back at the start of episode one, we promised that you'd hear from a US Open golf champion. That's because a strange footnote in the Erebus saga concerns a golf tournament scheduled to start in Wellington the day after the crash. It really wasn't part of the narrative of the disaster, but it's a unique story and sorrowful in its own way. Here's Mike on the 1979 Air New Zealand Open. Air New Zealand Chief Executive Maury Davis loved golf. He played so much he even crossed paths with Peter Mann a couple of times. The judge was a decent golfer himself. Davis once said they got on pretty well after their first match. Mann apparently didn't remember it, but Davis was sure. They had a few drinks in the clubhouse, he said, and organised another game. This was years before Erebus. The reason I'm telling you this is because Maury Davis's love of golf played an unlikely role in the aftermath of the Erebus disaster. On the day of the crash, November 28, 1979, Davis was on the course. But he was working, in a way. Starting in 1978, Air New Zealand sponsored a professional golf tournament, the Air New Zealand Open. It was Davis's brainchild, and the airline spent a ton of money on it, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Here's former tournament organiser Paul Gleeson. It was bigger than the New Zealand Open in prize money. It was bigger as far as attracting international players. And in fact, it sort of set a new standard for professional golf tournaments in New Zealand. We developed all sorts of new things that we all take for granted now, like hospitality tents and courtesy cars and all those sort of things. So it was a, quite a prestigious event. Prestigious enough that in 1978, no less than Arnold Palmer, one of the greatest and most popular golfers ever, came to New Zealand to play the Air New Zealand Open. He made a charge on the Sunday and finished third, a few shots behind the winner, Bob Charles. In 1979, an arguably stronger field was assembled. There were major winners like the Americans Gene Littler and Billy Casper and the Aussies Peter Thompson and David Graham and a Kiwi amateur playing his first tournament as a pro named Frank Nobolo. The tournament, now called the Air New Zealand Shell Open, was due to start on Thursday, November 29 at the Royal Wellington Golf Course at Hedatanga in Upper Hutt. On Wednesday, November 28, there was a Pro-Am tournament. That's where Maury Davis was that day. His playing partner was David Graham, Graham was the big draw card that year. He was fresh off a major win in the PGA Championship and would win the US Open a couple of years later. On the flag step. You'll see him make this little putt now for a par, a round of 67, seven under for the championship. David Graham had won. Graham, long retired and now living in the US, clearly remembers when news about the Antarctic flight filtered through. He was on the golf course and I was on the golf course. We got wind of the, the crash. Obviously he left. The timing here is a little bit hazy. Paul Gleeson was sure the Pro-Am was over when they heard from headquarters late in the afternoon. Graham remembers they were on the course. Either way, Maury Davis left immediately and took a special flight back to Auckland. And at that point, there was no crash, just an Air New Zealand DC-10 on a sightseeing trip to Antarctica that was unaccounted for. Last contact was made at 2.30 in the region of... NAF McMurdo, the aircraft was flying in good weather conditions, visibility is about 40 kilometres, so really conditions were excellent down there. Well, it's with great regret that we must uh, now accept that the aircraft is lost. Fuel reserves were exhausted approximately half an hour ago, and the aircraft has to be down. The plane was finally found on the slopes of Erebus around midnight. Maury Davis, now back in Auckland, address the media. Just wanted to tell you that the wreckage has been sighted in the Antarctica on um, a location which indicates Mount Erebus. Tournament director Paul Gleeson, who worked for Air New Zealand then, 
watched the news on TV with his colleagues. It was dreadful. I had a personal friend on board. It was just diabolical. A lot of the cabin crew we knew, as the week progressed, we, we, there were more and more people that we knew because New Zealand was a big family, really. Erebus was the worst peacetime tragedy New Zealand had ever faced. At the time, it was the fourth deadliest air crash ever. And the airline involved was staging one of its biggest promotional events the next day. It was an appalling and unprecedented confluence of events. But late on Wednesday night and the early hours of Thursday, there wasn't too much thought about how the crash might affect the tournament. Except for one thing. The Royal Wellington course was blanketed in Air New Zealand signage, much of which sported the company's new slogan, Nobody Does It Better. Staff worked through the night to take it all down. I believe it was just listening to the early morning radio, what had happened, and then getting to the golf course, and there were men on course dropping the signs, and flags were at half mast. This is Phil Aiken. In 1979, he was 18 years old, an amateur golfer playing one of the biggest tournaments of his life. He was so focused on his game, he hadn't heard the news about the crash on the Wednesday night or thought about what it might mean for the tournament. You know, I was only 18, probably unaware of the impact that it was going to bring. Yeah, just a little naive, perhaps. I was very much into trying to get myself around the golf course and do myself credit in what was a really strong field. On Thursday morning, Paul Gleeson drove out to the course. At this point, no one had mentioned cancellation. We weren't sure what was happening. It was, certainly wasn't suggested then. It was only later in the morning that uh, we were approached by Bob Shearer, an Australian professional. Bob Shearer had been talking with some of the other Australian pros, guys like David Graham and Roger Davis. According to media reports at the time, the Aussies told the organisers they wanted to withdraw as a mark of respect. The story cited New Zealand PGA rules that any player who pulled out of a tournament for anything other than medical reasons could be fined up to $200. But Gleeson recalls Shearer wording it differently. He approached us and said that some of the invited players and the other players had been talking and they were suggesting that if we wanted to cancel the tournament, they wouldn't object, they would support that. David Graham, one of those invited players, remembers the same. We felt so bad, obviously, like the whole country did. And I had said, you know, if you cancel the tournament, you've got my support. And I think all of the players decided that we would go with whatever decision that they made. So, with the players on board, whatever happened, organisers had a decision to make. Gleeson called Maury Davis in Auckland. I rang his office and spoke to his secretary, explained the situation, and she went and spoke to him and came back and said, no, it's his desire that the tournament should continue. Davis had thanked the players for their sympathy and asked that they play on as a personal favour to him. So that's what happened. David Graham again. It was very difficult. You know, we were playing golf in the shadows of something horrific and it was hard to play. The atmosphere was gloomy, but we played and we did the best we could under the circumstances. Phil Aiken, the 18-year-old amateur, cleared his head and started his round. Being so focused at the time, his memory 40 years on is more about the golf than the circumstances, like the howling Wellington wind which played havoc with everyone's scores. But he clearly remembers that he teed off early enough to see core staff taking down the last of the Air New Zealand signage as they played. My recollection is that there were still workers on the course when we were playing. It just wasn't normal, I think. Very few spectators were out. Again, with the signs down, flags down, the whole field was certainly feeling it. And golf was just trying to continue on with the event at the time as was being led from the top. After four days, David Graham emerged victorious. He won by eight strokes. Thanks to the wind, he was the only one to finish under par. Maury Davis made his first public appearance since the crash to attend the prize giving. He thanked the players and officials for soldiering on, and the spectators who, like so many New Zealanders, may have known someone on the flight. The dark cloud of tragedy, Davis said, will be with us all for some time to come. In accepting the title, David Graham expressed sympathy on behalf of all the players to Maury Davis and his wife, Myra. I know this has been a most difficult week for them, he said. It 
was a very, very sad scenario. Everyone was mourning the tragedy and everyone felt sorry for everybody. And we put on as good a show as we possibly could under the circumstances. I mean, it was a very shallow victory for anyone. It was very shallow to even play, but that's what the organizers wanted us to do. And that's what we did. Maury Davis was central to the story of the 1979 Air New Zealand Open and, of course, the Erebus story as a whole. One thing you always feel as a journalist is that you want to give each side a fair go when you tell a story. With Erebus, it sometimes felt like Davis got cast as the villain, partly because he was a pugnacious character and partly because so many people got behind Justice Peter Mann and his version of events. But the thing is, apart from one long interview, Davis never really revealed very much about who he was or how Erebus had affected him. It was clear that not everyone liked him. Annie, who you heard from earlier, struggled with his people skills, or lack thereof. The only involvement was when he travelled on the aircraft and boarding the aircraft and disembarking the aircraft, he never looked you in the eye and he grunted personality of a net. I guess in those days, managing directors just didn't have to have people skills, so to speak. He did not have people skills at all. Pogo Watson describes Maury Davis as a man's man. Pogo was the vice president of the Cabin Services Union, so he had a bit to do with Davis, even after his retirement. Not too many people know this, but one evening, Pogo decided to pay a visit to Maury Davis even though he had never been to his boss's house before. When he knocked at the door, Davis's wife, Myra, answered and let him in. And his voice from down the hallway called out, what do you want? What are you doing here? And I said, I've come to apply for the gardener's job, and I think I'm in the nick of time. And he said, get down here. And uh, we had a, quite a session that night, and uh, he told me things that uh, I vowed that I would never repeat, which I would never do today. Pogo did say that that night he gained some insight into what the Erebus disaster had done to Maury Davis. I understand his situation and, uh, and the effect that it has on uh, families and his family. Uh, his daughter at that time was going to university she was bullied at the university. I knew quite a number of things. I didn't push Pogo Watson to break that confidence, but I did ask if he thought the former airline boss had any regrets from that period. He thinks Davis was pushed into a situation he had no control over. Murray well, does. I believe in my own mind, had no choice to do what he did. There were some terrible decisions and actions made in those days against the flight deck of that particular flight. But who knows how to handle something like that? You've got to put sometimes put yourself in other people's uh, position and say, how would you do this when uh, there's so much stress and sadness involved in uh, the aftermath? it's had, obviously, a big impact on your life. Oh, certainly has. And, to another point, has made me stronger. Even though my, my voice at times might not have sounded too uh, strong, a bit shaky, but that's emotion. And so, that's it for now. We've learned a lot as we've made this podcast, and we made a couple of mistakes along the way. If you listen to episode two, The Caravan, in the day or two after it was released, you might have heard a couple of small errors that have since been corrected. We talked there about the disastrous crash between two jumbo jets at an airport in Tenerife in 1977. And we said that one of the jumbos was taking off and the other was landing when they collided. So thank you to the couple of people who wrote in to point out that in fact one was taking off and the other was taxiing when the crash happened. 
We also, in that episode, talked about the team that transcribed the cockpit voice recorder, or black box, from Flight TE-901 in the weeks after the crash. One of those men was Don Olive, who we described as an Air New Zealand pilot. Olive's family got in touch to say that he was, in fact, Air New Zealand's chief flight engineer for DC-10s at the time. So thanks for letting us know. We appreciate it. If we hear more from you and have other stories to share, we may be back. We're also hosting a live show of White Silence in Christchurch in a couple of months as part of the Bread and Circus Buskers Festival. It's a panel discussion, so we'll have some special guests, and Michael and I will both be there to talk about how we made the podcast and answer your questions as well. This has been a fascinating and moving project to work on, and for me it's filled in a gap I didn't quite realise was there. As someone whose family had a friend on board the flight, it's clarified a story that was there in the background of my childhood, but that I was too young to understand. As we said at the start, the story touched so many people across the country, and it's been a real privilege to hear some of those stories in this episode and to share them with another whole generation of New Zealanders. Because one of the things we've learned is that a lot of people, especially those of us who weren't born or were very young when all of this happened, don't know very much about Erebus. It's been so fraught for so long, it's kind of become buried, something that's too hard or too far in the past to talk about. So if you take anything from White Silence, I hope it's a deeper understanding of what happened. We aren't very good at dealing with tragedies in New Zealand, especially when there's a question of blame. And if we're going to get any better, we need to start looking differently at our worst ever disaster. It's been a blight on our history for 40 years, and it would be great if that started to change. Hopefully, White Silence has done that for you. Thanks for listening. White Silence is a joint production by Stuff and RNZ, written, presented and produced by Michael Wright and me, Katie Gossett. Our executive producers are Justin Gregory and Tim Watkin for RNZ, and for Stuff, Carol Hirschfeld, Keith Lynch, John Hartevelt, Carmela Heyman and Adam Dudding also helped produce this podcast. This episode was engineered by Alex Harmer and included audio from Nga Taonga Sound and Vision. You can subscribe to the full seven-part series at Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other podcast providers. You can also go to the Stuff and RNZ homepages to listen or get details on how to subscribe. And don't forget our live show in Christchurch on January the 26th as part of Bread and Circus. It's a free event, but it would pay to book early. Check out breadandcircus.co.nz backslash white silence for tickets and more details. And if you enjoyed this, you can check out other Stuff and RNZ podcasts like Gone Fishing, Killjoy, Black Hands, The District or New Zealand Wars.